Have you ever wondered why adverse things happen to people with good natures? Today, we're going to delve into one of the most fascinating and profound narratives in human history, the Saga of Job. Imagine losing everything that is precious to you and still keeping the faith. This is not just an ancient tale, but a thrilling journey that challenges the foundations of our deepest convictions. Unravel the mysteries of Job, a man who faced unimaginable situations and yet remained steadfast. Stay with us and see how this ancient narrative continues to resonate powerfully in our lives today. In the biblical story of the book of Job, we meet a wealthy man called Job, who lived in a town known as Uz. He had a large family and impressive flocks. Job was a person of integrity and uprightness, always dedicated to living a morally exemplary life, maintaining a disciplined relationship with God. In the land of Uz, there lived a man called Job. He was irreproachable and honest, revering God and avoiding evil. With seven sons and three daughters, Job owned 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 pairs of oxen, 500 donkeys, and a considerable number of servants. He was recognized as the most prominent of all the inhabitants of the East. Job's sons used to celebrate festivities in their homes during his birthdays, inviting his three sisters to share meals and drinks. After these celebrations, Job would perform a purification ritual for them. In the early hours of the morning, he would offer a burnt sacrifice for each of them, pondering, Perhaps my children have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. This was Job's regular practice, as described in verses 1 to 5 of the first chapter. God highlighted Job's virtues to Satan. However, Satan argued that Job maintained his righteousness only because God favored him abundantly. On a certain day the angel stood before the Lord, and Satan was also among them. The Lord asked Satan, Where do you come from? Satan answered the Lord, walking all over the earth, coming and going through it. Then the Lord said to Satan, Have you noticed my servant Job? There is no one on earth like him, upright and just, who fears God and shuns evil. Lied Satan, You have protected him, his house and everything he owns. You have blessed his deeds, and his flocks have been scattered over the earth. These dialogues between God and Satan are recounted in the book of Job, chapter 1, verses 6 to 10. Satan challenged God, saying that if he could afflict Job, he would change and curse God. God allowed Satan to torment Job to test this audacious statement, but forbade him to take Job's life. Reach out your hand and touch everything he owns, and he will surely curse you to your face, the Lord told Satan. Very well then, everything he possesses is in your power but don't lay a hand on the man himself. Then Satan left the presence of the Lord. These events are described in the book of Job, chapter 1, verses 11 and 12. In a single day, Job received four messages, informing him that his sheep, servants, and ten children had died, victims of raids by thieves or natural disasters. While Job's sons and daughters were celebrating and drinking wine at their eldest brother's house, a messenger came to Job reporting, the oxen were plowing and the donkeys grazing nearby when the Sabians attacked and took them. They killed the servants with the sword, and I was the only one who escaped to tell you about it. While he was still speaking, another messenger arrived and said, God's fire fell from heaven and burned up the sheep and the servants, and I was the only one who escaped to tell you. While he was still speaking, another messenger arrived. The Chaldeans formed three raiding parties and made a surprise attack on your camels, driving them away. They killed the servants with the sword, and I was the only one who managed to escape to inform you. Still talking, another messenger arrived saying, Your sons and daughters were feasting and drinking wine in their eldest brother's house, when suddenly a strong wind came from the desert and hit the four corners of the house. It collapsed on them and they died. I'm the only one who escaped to tell you. These tragic events are described in the book of Job, chapter 1, verses 13 and 19. In his grief, Job tore his clothes and shaved his head, but he still praised God in his prayers. Then Job arose, tore his robe, shaved his head, and fell to the ground and worshipped, declaring, Naked I came out of my mother's womb, and naked I shall depart. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. In all this, Job did not sin nor did he attribute any fault to God. 
This response from Job is recorded in the book of Job, chapter 1, verses 20 to 22. Satan appears again in heaven, and God gives him another opportunity to test Job. This time, Job suffers terrible afflictions on his skin. Job's wife tries to persuade him to curse God and give up his life, but he resists, trying to endure his sufferings. Two plots are skillfully interwoven, one heavenly and one earthly. The events on earth result from something that has already happened in heaven, just as there is conflict on earth immediately after a heavenly conflict, as in the book of Revelation. Eliphaz, Bildad, and Zophar, Job's three friends, arrive to console him, remaining silent for seven days out of respect for his grief. Job speaks on the seventh day, starting a dialogue in which each of the four men offers poetic descriptions of their tribulations. Job curses the day of his birth, comparing life and death to light and darkness. He expresses the wish that he had never been born and that his birth had been shrouded in darkness, feeling that life only adds to his agony. Eliphaz replies that Job, who previously consoled others, now admits that he doesn't truly understand the suffering of others. Eliphaz concludes that Job's pain must be the result of some sin and advises him to seek God's favor. Bildad and Zophar agree that Job must have committed some evil to attract divine justice, arguing that he should show more innocent behavior. Bildad suggests that Job's children have brought death upon themselves, while Zophar insinuates that any mistake by Job would deserve a much more severe punishment than his current suffering. Job responds to each of these comments, expressing such irritation that he calls his friends useless doctors who mask their help with lies, as described in the book of Job, chapter 13, verses 1 to 4. My ears have heard and understood, and what you know I also know. I am not inferior to you. However, I want to talk to the Almighty and present my case before God. You, however, slander me with falsehoods. You are all like ineffective doctors. Job wonders why God judges people based on their actions, when he could easily correct or forgive them. Perplexed, Job reflects on how a human being can fully satisfy God's justice, considering that divine ways are mysterious and transcend human understanding. Moreover, humans do not have the power to persuade God with their words. God is not fooled, and Job admits that he doesn't even know himself well enough to present his case before God. Job longs for a mediator between him and God to avoid being condemned to Sheol, the underworld. He believes in the existence of a witness or redeemer in heaven who will vouch for his integrity, as he expresses in chapter 19, verse 25. I know that my redeemer lives and that in the end he will stand on the earth. Furthermore, in chapter 16, verse 19, Job states, even now my witness is in heaven, my advocate is on high. The suffering becomes unbearable for Job, making him bitter, anxious, and apprehensive. He laments God's apparent injustice in allowing evil people to prosper while he and other righteous people suffer. Job longs to confront God and protest, but he can't physically meet him. He recognizes that wisdom is hidden from humanity, but decides to seek it by fearing God and avoiding evil. Finally, God intervenes in the divine dialogue of the first round. During the speeches, Job asked God 36 times to speak to him. Now his wish is granted. Both times God communicates with Job, it takes place in the middle of a storm, with a note of humor in the way God addresses him. Job is reminded by God that he is the creator of everything. God goes through his remarkable activity of creating and sustaining the world, challenging Job to match this great work. He concludes by asking if Job is in a position to judge, pointing out that it is inappropriate for Job to think that God should explain himself to him. Job is confronted with his smallness, Finally, Job replies, I am unworthy, how can I answer you? I put my hand over my mouth. I have spoken once, but I have no answer. Twice, but I will say no more. In the second round, God does not speak of himself as creator, but talks about two of his creatures. The speech maintains a humorous tone, questioning Job about his ideas on the hippopotamus, behemoth, and the crocodile leviathan, as if these extraordinary creatures held the answers to life's great enigmas, Job is reminded that he cannot understand God, the animal world, and even less, the moral world. God's central point is, why are you trying to argue with me? 
Job recognizes God's omniscience and the impossibility of thwarting his plans. He understands that questioning God was inappropriate and humbles himself, repenting in ashes and dust. Although the encounter with God is humiliating for Job, the core of his problem is dealt with, and he reconnects with God, providing a magnificent and unexpected climax to the book. In the epilogue, the text transitions from poetry to prose, and Job accepts that he should not blame God for his interactions. God restores Job's children, property camels and flocks of sheep, making him richer and happier than before. As God's servant, Job is rehabilitated. However, Job's three friends are severely rebuked by God, who says that they have not spoken correctly about Job, indicating that we should not take their speeches as truths. What is remarkable about God's two rounds with Job is that he doesn't answer Job's questions or reveal the bet with Satan. Job didn't need to understand what was happening in heaven because God had reasons for allowing his suffering. It is important to highlight the clear difference between the Jewish and Christian understanding of the book of Job. The Jews of the Old Testament saw God's justice as something to be manifested in this life, since both the righteous and the wicked went to the same destination. Sheol, a place of dark existence where spirits rested. In contrast, Christians see present suffering in the light of eternity, seeing a heavenly vision magnified by the work of Christ. The book of Job suggests only hints of life after death, with Job declaring that he will meet God after his death, although this theme does not recur and does not detail how this will happen. The book of Job has two main plots, the divine plot and the earthly plot. It begins with the heavenly plot, revealing the meeting of God in heaven with Satan, an angel who reported sins and acted as an accuser before God. By the time of Job, Satan had become so skeptical that he doubted that anyone could love God for God's own sake, believing that people loved God only for what he could offer. This sparks a debate between God and Satan, with the latter arguing exactly this perspective. God questions whether Satan has met Job in his travels on earth, claiming that Job loves him for who he is, not just for the blessings he has received. Satan's response is cynical, suggesting that if God were to withdraw Job's blessings, he would blaspheme just like anyone else. This leads to the divine wager, an essential tension in any meaningful drama. Job remains oblivious to the divine wager while the reader is aware, making the test pointless if he knew about it. This encounter reveals valuable truths about Satan, suggesting that he cannot be in two places at once, lacking God's omnipresence. The human plot, centered on the debate between Job and his friends, takes up most of the book exploring the central question, why is Job suffering more than others? Two points of view emerge. The friends claim that Job's suffering is the result of his sins, while Job insists that he is without sin, protesting his innocence. The exchange is full of suspense, as the reader knows the truth. The structure of two plots in the book emphasizes that no one has the whole picture when trying to understand the reasons for human suffering. Defending oneself in the midst of misery is challenging, and in addition to the search for explanations, everyone is confronted with the big question. Can I continue to believe in a good God when everything seems to be going wrong? The book of Job offers an answer to this question. When it comes to Job's greatest pain, it wasn't just a physical affliction. Covered in sores from head to toe, exhausted and in excruciating pain, he also faced social isolation. Because of his appearance and the recent tragedy known to the community, he became an outcast, sitting in a pile of ashes at the edge of the village while people avoided interacting with him, including teenagers who laughed at him. Mentally, he confronted the anguish of not understanding why such painful events were occurring in his life, especially since nothing in his past indicated such an outcome. Spiritually, his distress was even more intense as he felt a distance from God. Job cried out, begging God to meet him, talk to him, and even discuss his situation. This was truly the deepest and most agonizing pain. Suffering becomes particularly agonizing when we believe that God is distant and seemingly indifferent. However, when Job finally managed to communicate with God, things didn't turn out as he had hoped. 
In the context of the New Testament, for Christians, God allowed Satan to bring about Jesus' death on the cross, with the Son himself questioning, My God, why? Similar to Job, God did not provide a clear explanation. This suggests that even the Son of God, under the intensity of the torment of crucifixion, lost his understanding of the purpose of his suffering. The Christian understands that life extends beyond death, and the dilemmas of suffering do not necessarily find resolution in this existence. It is worth noting that in the Greek version of the book of Job, an additional verse suggests that he will be resurrected with those whom the Lord also resurrects. This hope of resurrection points to a future claim of Job. Christians believe that Jesus will return to judge the living and the dead at the end of time. A tribunal will be established where Jesus, as judge, will evaluate the actions of all people, wicked and pious, throughout their lives. Job's longing for justice is about to be realized. Our exploration of the depths of Job's story reveals a journey of faith, suffering, and redemption that resonates with the soul and challenges our understanding. If you have been inspired, intrigued, or questioned, know that there is still more to be discovered. Each story shared here is a new opportunity for internal reflection and observation of the world around us. Don't miss a moment of these fascinating explorations. Subscribe now, leave a like if today's story resonated with you, and share in the comments how it has impacted your life. And don't forget to share this video with someone who, like you, enjoys unraveling the mysteries of life and faith. Together, we'll continue this journey of discovery and inspiration. Thanks for watching, and see you next time.